I just want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Um, my name is Representative Kathleen James, and um, I represent the Bennington 4 District, which is um, Manchester, Arlington, Sandy, and part of Sunderland. And um, my role this evening uh, is really just as a convener. Um, I am certainly not a, a broadband uh, technical expert, um, but I did watch with great interest as this, uh, as this bill moved through the legislature this year. And then as some folks over in Wyndham County um, and down in Shaftesbury started uh, getting some work done. And uh, I really wanted to try to get everybody in the same room who was interested in this issue and um, see if we can get some folks talking to each other and make some progress up here in our neck of the woods. So um, I'm going to introduce everybody and then um, just take some notes. And um, after I introduce our presenters tonight, I thought we could quickly go around the room and just have everybody say um, only their name and what town they're from so that we can kind of kind of stay on track tonight. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm Kathleen James. Um, Tonight, uh, who you're going to be hearing from is Representative Robin Chestnut Tangerman, Representative Laura Sebelia, um, Clay Purvis. Clay is the uh, Director of Telecommunications and Connectivity at the Vermont Department of Public Service. We have um, Rob Fish, a brand new hire. You'll hear about uh, his, his uh, new position. He is the Rural Broadband Technical Assistance Specialist with uh, DPS. And then we also have tonight, and I'm really grateful that he drove over, um, Stan Williams. He is the board chair and CFO of ValleyNet. Um, ValleyNet is a nonprofit that's uh, working to bring high-speed fiber to underserved communities in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, all right, um, Robin, why don't you uh, take it away? I'm glad to see Wes Rupert here, of course. The third of the town, right? <laughs> um, I thought what I would do is, is uh, just a very quick overview of the bill uh, H513 that we, was signed into law this year. And, and it does a very broad swath of things, and we'll probably be talking about a few of those this evening. But I just wanted to make you aware of the, <coughs> the range of things. And the, the idea being that um, there's no one solution. Every community is different. Uh, the needs are different, the options it, and what's available are different, the resources of the community, uh, both financial and technological, are different. So we need a wide variety of options. Um, and so the, what the bill did, um, I just, 16 different things, um, but including raising revenue by uh, increasing the universal service charge on your phone bill, because that pays for a number of different state programs, and the last one, after everything else is paid for, the last piece of it goes into uh, broadband um, build out, the connectivity fund. And uh, that fund last year was zero, right? Yep. Yes. Um, so this increases it uh, by about, well, it raises, I think, a million and a half um, to put toward that. And that money is also used for the new hire to provide uh, consulting services to, to rural Vermont uh, for broadband. <coughs> um, it also provides funding in the way it makes broadband fun innovation grants available uh, that's within the Department of Public Service, but um, also through uh, the Vermont Economic Development Authority. And this is talking about large amounts of money, like uh, up to 1.8 million, I believe. Uh, for infrastructure build out, for getting the communications district uh, up and running. Uh, it takes more than that to do build out, obviously, but it's, you know, it's, it's more than the uh, you know, $15,000 that we had been able to offer previously. Um, <clears throat> it does a number of technical things, um, uh, including uh, instructing the Department of Public Service to resolve their workshops on broadband power, I mean, on uh, backup power for um, the uh, fiber, uh, good lord, <laughs> yeah, fiber, fiber, optic, yeah. fiber optic cables as backup batteries in the house if the power goes out. And if, but if power's out for too long, your backup battery dies and then you are without 
connectivity. Um, but also uh, resolve some issues on pole rental space. This is uh, not really our purview tonight. Um, it uh, <coughs> allows um, public-private partnerships, just again as another possibility. Um, that a, a, a <coughs> communications district or a, a town may not have the facility, the ability to set up a project on their own, but perhaps they could partner with an existing uh, provider. It uh, <coughs> uh, provides consulting services, as we said, requires a number of studies, including uh, the Department of Health to do a study on 5G broadband health effects. Um, a study on uh, electric utility companies becoming broadband providers, uh, since they have a vested interest in having um, high-speed connectivity uh, for grid management. Um, and uh, also a study on uh, PEG access funding, um, which is part of uh, cable communications. Um, and uh, allows and, and provides minor support for communities interested in setting up uh, 2G microcells that the state owns and had operated some of um, to provide very localized service. Um, it provides uh, access and some technological uh, advice. So it's, it's a very broad uh, bill I left out some pieces of it, but the, the gist of it is the ability for towns to uh, towns or communication districts to set up their own service and for the state to provide uh, money and expertise uh, to do so. And I will now hand it over to who's next? Okay. Yeah. So I know that uh, Clay and uh, Stan will give you much more kind of in-depth nuts and bolts information on some of the mechanics. I want to talk to you about why it's important, and I'm so excited to see so many of you out here. I think that's an optimist. I was telling Kathleen, good turnout. You got a great number of towns, a good mix of towns here. So for those of you that already have this information, I hope you'll just bear with me. Um, I see a pretty significant, I have a pretty significant sense of urgency around this issue. Um, for those of you that don't have cable or fiber, you don't have it because it hasn't been profitable for the providers to bring it to you. And uh, they're not, it's, so that's not likely to change. Uh, for those of you that don't have cable or internet, you have your copper landline, your telephone, right? Um, and uh, some of you may have DSL. We got DSL on Goose City, which is in East Dover, where I live. Several years ago, my town paid to kind of bring that out. But we still have that old copper telephone line uh, running out through the woods there. And when we think about what the state of Vermont can do to help get you internet, it's, con it's not actually that much. There's, we are really federally preempted on a lot of the regulations um, regarding internet. So we can regulate the copper landlines, but we cannot regulate the internet. And so it's been really hard, and you know, we've been for years trying to figure out you know, where are the sticks you know, or the carrots to try and get some build out. What's changing is the the nature of that copper network, for me anyway. I have had constituents who have lost their service, just their telephone service. Um, and it's taking a long time for that to get repaired. And this is in rural areas where there's no cell service, limited internet. It's really their only means of calling for help, and they're out pretty rurally. And so what does that have to do with all of this? <clears throat> These, these issues are really connected. In the places that have cable and that have internet, a lot of times folks are getting rid of their landline telephone because you can use your telephone if you have cable or if you have internet. And so what's happening is that old copper network that everybody used to connect to, now there's fewer and fewer people that are using it. And it's very expensive for the company to maintain it. Um, the places where that's all they've got, they're pretty far out there. Uh, and so 
um, this is becoming a greater and greater problem. More expensive um, to fix, and people out in the rural areas are really reliant on it, as I said, to call for help. So <clears throat> this is putting a lot of pressure on um, our what, incumbent um, carrier here, the phone carrier. So the way to ensure that our folks can call for help, they're not going to rebuild this copper, this copper line. We really need to get fiber out into these communities. You could get wireless, um, you know, if you can get wireless where, uh, with a good signal, but really the answer is fiber. So if you build out fiber, you can have access to phone, you can have access to television, you can have access to the internet. There are other options, but really, ideally, that's what you do. So because we could not make these providers come and do this, um, we've really talked about feeling this sense of urgency that some of our folks cannot, are, you know, their ability to call for help is in jeopardy. We said, all right, we're going to put tools together so that our towns can try to save themselves here and ensure that their residents can call for help. Um, you know, we'll we're going to continue to work on this, but this is a big problem, right? And it's a heavy lift. So, and it's really important. <clears throat> so you will hear about from Clay, he's got a great presentation on the various tools with um, H513 and how to access them. I'm so excited that Rob Fish is here. This is his first meeting, good job. Excellent. <laughs> uh, we really wanted to make sure that there was added help for our volunteers, right, who are trying to put this together. You guys are not technical experts, but it's really on you, it's on you. So, and then you'll hear from Stan, who, um, you know, Vermont is really lucky. We have a great model that has been built here um, for rural broadband, for fiber, um, and uh, it's EC fiber. And so Stan has come and he can talk a little bit about that, which is fantastic. Um, let's see if I have anything else that's important to say to you before um, we turn it over to these guys, and I do. <laughs> so, um, two things. Two, I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening in Wyndham. Um, but before I do that, I want to say to you, one of the things that we are seeing in Wyndham is our towns in Vermont were super self-sufficient. The individual super-powered. So were the towns super-powered. So we're seeing a lot of our towns coming out of the gate in Wyndham saying, we got it. We can do it on our own. And really, we want to see you partner. You can do it on your own. You can. Nobody's going to stop you. Um, but this is hard. This is hard. Uh, and you will be in a better position if you are working with your neighbors, OK? <clears throat> so what we have done in Wyndham, and I will note, um, we are sitting in the Southern Vermont Economic Development Zone, OK, which is a special area in Vermont uh, that has some significant needs. Jonathan Cooper in the back and I have worked on um, uh, with a number of you, uh, the Red Group, which Tim's on, and uh, the Sevitz Group in Wyndham <coughs> County, on a five-year comprehensive economic development strategy. What does that mean? Why should you care? That's a federally prescribed plan, okay? So we have a special zone that you're sitting in, which is Wyndham and Bennington County. There's a five-year plan, and in that five-year plan, one of the highest priorities is we need to get internet and cell in that area. So that could be helpful in terms of accessing funds, attention, um, cooperation. Uh, in addition, in Wyndham County, Stan's um, colleague, uh, well, no, ValleyNet, ValleyNet, um, which he'll talk, are you gonna talk about that? <coughs> yes, okay. So he'll talk about that, but his group is working with our regional <coughs> planning commission they have applied for a broadband innovation grant, which Clay will talk about, to look at how in Wyndham County we can build a CUD or where it might make sense to try and help people form small CUDs. Um, I know we're looking at a region-wide, but you know there may be need to be additional ones. Um, and this week, I went to um, some of our towns are you know have broadband committees. They've started doing some work, started sketching out, doing some surveying. Some of them are pretty advanced, getting ready to do poll surveys, but not too many. Most are not. Um, this week, I was invited to a meeting of four select boards. Um, they wanted four rural towns. Uh, it was Whitingham, Wilmington, Halifax, and Reedsboro. Uh, uh, it was Whitingham that invited them all, and they wanted to talk to them about police and fire 
broadband and schools. And so uh, they started with broadband and took up most of the meeting, but they made the decision that they would form a four-town committee. They're not sure they want to do a CUD yet. They're not sure they want to work together. But they know that they could learn better if they're learning together. So they've put those four towns together with a select board person and a citizen. Um, and I would highly encourage you, you all, all of your neighbors, if you are here, okay, there's a lot of towns here, your neighbors are going to be looking for the same information that you are, okay? You will have some common shared problems. If for no other reason than learning, I would encourage you to try and learn together. This is hard work and it's going to take years. Um, I will say for myself, I know Robin, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep Kathleen, <laughs> keep Kathleen going. Um, you know, we're, we'll be looking to see what additional tools we can help, um, you know, to support this work. I wish it was not up to you, but it is up to you. It's up to you. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you very play. much. Okay, is it play next? Um, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to run out of things to talk about. Everyone's covered all the big stuff. Oh, okay. Um, but thank you, Laura. Um, you have pictures. I do. I have pictures. Um, <laughs> just at the outset, um, before I begin, I just want to let everyone know that there are maps um, over on the table of Bennington County, so you can get a picture of two pictures, really, of where broadband is. The first map is the 4-1 uh, map. Uh, so you'll see in the legend it says four uh, megabits, uh, four slash one megabits per second. That's basic DSL. So we collect broadband data. Yep. You should tell me. I need more of it. I will. I, this is the outset. I'm going to get to that. But people are going to look at the maps okay. and um, not listen uh, to who I am uh, if they're you know interested in the maps. So I'm okay. going to explain the maps. Um, uh, that is basic DSL. The second map is the 25-3 map. Um, you'll see there's less blue on that. That's where cable television is. So cable can do much better broadband. That's where the good broadband is in Bennington. All right, so now my name is Clay Purvis. I'm the director for telecommunications and connectivity um, at the Department of Public Service. Um, we are the ratepayer advocate for Vermont and proceedings before the Public Utility Commission. So that's our main focus, that's our main job. Um, so in cases dealing with electricity, telephone, water, and gas, um, we represent the, the public interest in, in those cases. So when Green Mountain Power comes in for a, an increase to their rates, um, that's, um, uh, we act kind of like as a prosecutor, um, as a, a counterpoint to uh, the company's request. Um, but with broadband, we don't do anything at the Public Utility Commission when it comes to broadband. Why? Because it's not a regulated service. We don't have the authority to regulate broadband. Um, the federal government preempts us from most aspects of broadband regulation. So when we talk about expansion of broadband, the state can't mandate that companies go into communities, serve communities like we can with electricity. Everyone has electricity, right? Yep. Um, but not everyone has broadband, and that's the reason why. Um, so we are left with um, doing other things. Um, uh, uh, Representative Sibelia talked about carrots and sticks. Uh, not a lot of sticks, but we, we can do carrots. Um, and, and the federal government is the same thing, too. So there's lots of broadband money around. I'll talk about that in greater detail um, coming up. But I want to start with a little bit on the reasons why you don't have broadband. It's the maps. And all right. So light touch regulation, I just explained that part. We don't regulate it, we can't. The federal government uh, has come up with this clever phrase called light touch regulation, uh, which basically means they don't regulate it. Um, so the FCC um, is doing a lot to promote broadband by, let's say, removing barriers um, to deployment. So that's 
they would prefer to spend their time preempting local zoning that pre prevents uh, cell towers from going up and things like that. But they don't do a whole lot with making companies actually deploy broadband. Um, competition is fierce, so unlike electricity or um, water or gas, um, and I'm talking about piped gas, not, um, uh, not like propane, um, the, the, it's not a comp competitive market. There's a monopoly. The Green Mountain Power has a monopoly on our area, and we set rates and we allow them to uh, recoup their costs through rates. Um, in broadband, it's, it's up to competition. Um, you, you go out, you start a business, and um, you fight with other broadband providers for uh, business. And because competition is fierce, you have multiple broadband providers in the urban and suburban areas. Private investment is really focused on what's my return on investment. And um, the return in suburban and urban areas is obviously greater. Um, coming out to a rural area, it's, it's very different. It's much more difficult. And in many cases, there is no business case to serve the areas that aren't blue here on the, on the cable map. And the last issue is geography. Our geography is difficult. Um, we're a very mountainous state. Our settlement patterns being what they are, we're spread out. Um, so, you know, there are many towns where you don't have a lot of people and the people are far apart from each other. So the cost of deploying broadband is much, much higher than it is in a suburban area, let's say like Manchester, New Hampshire, um, a very different business model uh, or business case there. I'm going to go quickly through um, current federal programs. Sorry, lean back here to do that. All right. There's lots of money everywhere in the federal government. Um, getting it is uh, the, the difficult part of um, using that money. Um, several programs, um, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, um, and I don't expect you to remember any of this. I just want to call it out. Um, I'll make the presentation available um, so that you can review it afterwards and uh, do your own research. Rural Digital Opportunity Fund is an FCC program. Uh, it's billions of dollars. It's funded through the Federal Universal Service Fund. So if you look at your telephone bill, you'll see a charge for your bill. Um, it, this program is funded through that. It's a rural broadband program. Um, they're going to um, auction the money. So companies are going to pro um, bid on uh, geographic areas called census blocks. These are little squares all over the state of Vermont. We have 15,000 in the state of Vermont. Um, little squares that um, have a few homes in each one. Um, they're going to bid on individual squares and um, the money's going to be auctioned out. Um, so uh, any ISP can, can participate. They're writing the rules for this now. So um, we're expecting um, we're expecting that money to go out next year, um, or at least the FCC does. I don't know if we do. Um, so that's a a very important. I'm sorry, I'm very cynical. I've been okay. doing this for five years now. <laughs> um, the, the FCC has done this already. You may have heard of CAF and CAF2. It was the Connect America Fund. Um, they gave out $50 million to um, our incumbent <coughs> telephone carrier, Consolidated, um, in 2015. So Consolidated built DSL with a lot of that money, so they expanded DSL service. Um, it was uh, beneficial um, in a lot of ways. A lot of people that didn't have broadband got it. Uh, people who had very slow broadband got um, slightly higher speeds. Uh, but the FCC has decided that auctioning money is better. So um, this is good in a way because companies like or uh, organizations like EC Fiber or smaller ISPs have an opportunity to bid on that money. Um, so keep an eye on that. The mobility fund. This is really for um, wireless carriers. There are only three companies in the nation that can really take advantage of the mobility fund. Um, there are smaller uh, rural wireless carriers. 
I'm not aware of any that we have in the state um, right now, but um, that's the same thing as the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, but for wireless service. It's four and a half billion dollars. We don't really know how the FCC plans to uh, um, give that out. The FCC believes, or at least believed at the outset, that Vermont was 98% served with cell coverage. Um, so all of us live in that 2%. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, there was a push for them to change their mapping and redo their mapping, so they're also looking at that. So we're um, hoping, praying that they fix the mapping and that some of that money will be available to us um, in the near future. E-rate is a long-standing FCC program. E-rate is for schools. Um, schools can use E-rate money to buy computer equipment, set up um, Wi-Fi within the schools. They can also build fiber with it. So I always like to call out E-rate. Um, so if you you know talk to your school and your library, there's um, <clears throat> a gentleman at the Agency of Education here in Vermont that does a lot of the E-rate work. So if you're interested in talking to him, I can give you his name. Um, but um, that is a resource that um, uh, is utilized by m many schools, but it could be changed um, or maybe um, integrated into whatever broadband plan you're making. The USDA has become the, the broadband federal agency. Um, they're, they're kind of stealing the FCC's thunder these days. Um, the USDA uh, has a $600 million, I should have had this up here, I apologize, um, a $600 million program called ReConnect. Um, and they will build broadband to areas that lack 25.3. Um, actually, they, they might actually be building to areas only that lack 10.1. Um, but this is a program that, um, because it's run out of the USDA, it really has nothing to do with what the FCC is doing. Um, but they've given out um, large um, loans and grants uh, to Vermont in the past. VTEL was the biggest taker of USDA grants and loans. Um, so this is a continuation of that program, the USDA Reconnect program. And um, there's money there. And then the Economic Development Administration, Northern Borders, and other USDA programs, there are a host of federal grant programs that have nothing to do with broadband. And some of our most successful projects in Vermont have taken those grants and used them for broadband. So um, really important to investigate Northern Borders Regional Commission, which I understand now will do the entire state of Vermont. Is that correct? Okay. Um, before they would just work in the, the counties that touched uh, the Canadian border uh, in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, but now they're doing the entire state. So that's new and open up to, um, to Bennington County. And then other USDA programs, they have a whole slew of programs. When we've met with the USDA, their recommendation was don't look at our grant programs, come meet with us and tell us what you want to do and we'll find the program that fits. So um, if you know what you want to do or the direction you want to go in, good to schedule a meeting with the USDA. They have an office in Montpelier. Clay, can I just yep. say something? Just to pile on to Clay's earlier cynicism comment, um, you know, we've known that <clears throat> the cell coverage maps are wildly inaccurate, but until, uh, until the department did some actual test drives of their own. We had nothing with which to refute it, no right. data. So, you know, it's one thing to know that their information is inaccurate. It's another thing to have to accurate them. information yeah. to refute it. Another thing, Clay mentioned census blocks and the uh, federal interpretation of service relating to census blocks is if there are 100 people in the census block and one person is served, with broadband, that census block is served and is no longer eligible for federal funding. Are all census blocks the same? No, they, they come in all shapes and sizes, and uh, there's, from our, I think from our perspective, there's really no rhyme or reason uh, to how they're developed. 
Um, we at the outset, oh, we have our own grant program I'll talk about in a minute. We, at the outset, we used census blocks to do our mapping and it was a nightmare because you'd have 10 addresses like on the southern side of a block, then you'd have a mountain, and then there would be one person on the other side, and that person, you know, got in and out of town through a completely different road, you know, their utility line went a completely different way. And so we would say we need to serve this entire census block. And really what it was was two different broadband projects. So um, we scrapped census blocks. We think it's a, um, a foolish way to um, look at broadband. And we are doing our own mapping, um, which I talked about at the outset, uh, on individual. Clay, can I add something yeah, on the mapping uh, just quick? Uh, just by individual locations. So we're looking at your house, your house, your house, and figuring out on an on a building by building basis who has broadband and who doesn't. The, 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 the broadband mapping effort at the FCC, I'll call it, is a joke. I mean, it uses technology and, and it's 30 years out of date. And it's a way that they can claim that they cover 98% of the US with broadband. And they do it two ways, by these census blocks, which are completely inaccurate and that one person being served does not cover the census block. And also, they rely on carrier data. So they say they're providing 25.3. Do any of you actually get 4.1 at the end of your, your road? No. But the federal government says, oh, the, you, you get 4.1. And that's what the maps are based on. So Clay, unfortunately, can't drive around the state and check everyone's actual DSL service like he did with, with mobile phones. But if he did, you, you'd find that the, 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 the coverage maps and, and those maps that they are wildly overstated. And the other thing that I'm particularly annoyed about as a marketer is that we compete against these companies and they say we offer you up to 4-1. The, the state of New York sued Charter Communication, which is a cable company. They got a $70 million rebate for their customers because they had been misstating their, their, their actual speeds that they're providing. So when we offer 25 megabits per second, it's in both directions and you get it like 90% of the time, not, through, not at 3 a.m. when there's one person doing it. So I, I'm, if you think Clay is, um, is cynical, I've been yeah. doing it for 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> so 2.4 times more cynical, especially about the efforts on the, on the federal government. We have received no federal funds and I wouldn't hold out a lot of hope for future um, federal funds being helpful because there's a lot of paperwork. I mean, it's possible, but right now it's difficult. There are a lot of federal funds that have come into the state. Um, on well, broadband. I'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we'll save time at the end for yeah. a and a So let's. Um, okay. Go. Yep. Keep going. But yeah, no. Uh, census blocks are all different shapes and sizes. Um, they have different numbers of houses and um, residents living there. So a census block in Burlington. Um, might have uh, you know a thousand people and be one block and then um, I lived in a census block with uh, three other people so um, and it was much larger than it was probably half the size of the city of Burlington so um, they, they it, it, I, how they decided I have no idea but um, it's publicly available information and we've long used it um, uh, for mapping the FCC uses it but it's created by the Census Bureau, and I think they use census blocks all over federal government, um, you know, to decide all manners of, of things. But um, so, uh, let's see, moving on. So um, the, that's really this is really what the federal government's up to when you look at what money is available for broadband. Um, uh, not many people have taken USDA money yet. It's something to really look into, but don't um, hold out hope for it. Um, there aren't a lot of areas eligible in Vermont right now. We're hoping that'll change next year. They're supposed to reassess census blocks um, across the nation to determine really if they're really served or not. Um, <clears throat> So they're going to do that, we hope, and hopefully that opens up uh, new territory for the USDA to, um, to make grants to. The USDA, through um, the Rural Utility Service, has all kinds of grants for electric utilities and um, 
uh, probably for telephone companies too. I don't, Mike, do you know? They do? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, they built rural telephone companies um, back in the 30s and 40s. So companies like Shoreham, are we close to Shoreham? No, 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 no nowhere near Shoreham. Uh, <laughs> I can't think of another, uh, I, maybe uh, TDS and Cavendish is probably Topsum. the close, Topsum. Uh, Waitsfield, Champlain Valley, these little companies, um, they, they're considered rural telephone uh, carriers and they, uh, many of them were built with USDA funding um, a long time ago. Um, so I'll move on to current state broadband programs. So now we're short on time. Oh. All, right. All right, so the uh, connectivity, oh, let me go back here. All right, communication union district. I'm gonna let um, uh, Stan pro uh, um, tackle this one in greater detail. But this is um, a, a legal entity, um, this is a statute that can create a legal entity for municipalities. Municipalities can partner with each other um, to build a telecommunications um, uh, network. Um, EC Fiber is an example of a communication union district. Um, Central Vermont Fiber is another example. Um, it, it really helps um, provide structure and governance. It makes them, it makes you look like a thing that the private you know, um, market can recognize, the bond market can recognize. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a, been a very good tool in Vermont. And it allows, um, as uh, Representative Sibelia touched on, uh, it allows um, communities to think more in terms of regional build out um, and not just their single town. Um, if you look at each individual town, what you're going to find is that half or two thirds of your town has adequate broadband and then there's the one third that doesn't. Or maybe it's one fourth that has it and three quarters that doesn't. Um, or that you have more broadband in Manchester, but then West Rupert has no broadband. Um, when you, uh, communities form into communication union districts, you're really thinking about uh, building a network that is going to target the unserved um, and come up with a much better strategy for, um, for doing that. Um, so that is the big one. I'm going to let Stan do that uh, in greater detail. The Connectivity Initiative, um, this is a grant program focused on the last mile. Um, as uh, Representative uh, Chestnut Tangerman uh, mentioned, uh, the, the H513 recently raised the universal service charge, our state universal service charge um, for this program. Uh, so we're going to spend cash on actually building broadband networks. Um, we're focused on the last mile. So again, going to your map, the, the blue addresses we're not interested in, we're interested in the orange. The people that do not have 401 today, the unserved. Um, we want to build broadband to those people. Um, we're looking for uh, internet service providers to bid on addresses, come up with a project and pitch it to us. Um, and we, uh, we, will, we will pay for that build. Uh, this program's great because it minimizes overbuilding. Um, we're not going to overbuild uh, Comcast and Bennington uh, to the, um, uh, rather than build out in West Rupert or something like that. Um, we're technology agnostic. All we care about is that what gets built provides at least 25 three. 25 megabits per second down, three up. That's the federal definition of broadband. That's what we want. Uh, most of the time, we're doing fiber these days. We've given a lot of money to EC Fiber. Um, we've given quite a bit of money to Comcast, too, which can do pretty good. But we've also given money to Consolidated, and we've had some great projects there in places where no one else wants to go. So. Um, again, as long as it meets the, the minimum speeds, we're technology agnostic, we're, we're company agnostic. It's scalable. The more money Representative uh, Chestnut Tingerman can give us, we'll take it and we'll spend it on broadband. 
So please, um, <laughs> you heard it here. Folks. <laughs> this is not the administration's position. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. <laughs> um, well, the rate increase, um, we're expecting, well, we don't know exactly what to expect, somewhere around a million dollars um, a year. Um, Those are match grants, right? Um, they're, uh, no, they're not actually match grants. What we care about is the cost per address is low, okay. lower than the other people or the other companies bidding. So if you partner with Consolidated and they say, I'm picking on Consolidated, they say we can do it for $2,000 address and the neighboring town partners with Comcast and they can do it for $3,000 address, we're going with Consolidated because the we're fairly ruthless when it comes to what is the cost to us per address. Um, the way to get that cost down is through a match. The more money you throw in, the lower you can get that cost, uh, the, the more attractive it is to us. So. How do we, do we have input on that? Is there just between you and Consolidated? The law says that, um, that ISPs are to make the bids. Um, where we've had the most success with the connectivity initiative is where uh, a town has partnered with an ISP to get the job done. Um, so, uh, uh, Craftsbury is an example um, from a bid we did last year. Um, Craftsbury actually, Craftsbury is a really good example of all of this because they got Northern Borders Regional Commission money, they got USDA money, they built their own network around town, and they uh, got a contractor on board to run that network, and that contractor uh, put in a connectivity initiative grant to, um, to do additional homes in West Craftsbury. So um, there, there's an example of something that's worked. Um, Consolidated is also um, this this last round, I believe we funded um, a project in Barnet, um, up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, uh, neighbors, it wasn't really the town that partnered with them, but it was actually a neighborhood uh, that, that was kind of left in the cold. The rest of the town had fairly decent broadband and um, this group did not. And they, they put in some of their own cash. Um, they worked with Consolidate on the project that they wanted and Consolidate made the final bid um, and th it was actually a very good project. So there's a couple of examples. I could go on. We have lots of examples of, of projects like that, but um, that, that to us is, is, a really, is really the direction that the connectivity initiative should, should be going in, um, that there is, there is some amount of community buy-in. So. I'm sorry, I'm trying to follow all this and all the yeah. connections, but all right, so I heard you, and just bear with me, yeah. I heard you talk about that um, communication union district, okay, so is that um, businesses and government entities that work in private citizens it's, that are working together, is it like a coalition? It's a, it's Stan's, a municipality. Stan's going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay, but because it, I guess what I was wondering is when it comes time to signing on or getting the money and you're ready to go, who's actually, or what is actually, who has the authority to say, it's, okay, yeah. we're signing and we're moving forward. So this. the uh, Communication Union District uh, statute has a lot on governance. It's, it's really municipalities. So um, your town, if they want to join a CD, they'll put it on the, uh, uh, you know, as a referendum at town hall meeting day. You'd go and vote, and if the town votes to join, you're joining um, and, and creating this thing. So uh, Central Vermont Fiber last year, there was a gentleman um, in, in Berlin who went around to, I think, 18 towns and got, got this put on the agenda at town meeting day in those 18 towns, and they all voted. Um, that's how the, one of these is formed. Once it's formed, there's a board of directors um, or a you know a, a, a governing body with an appointment being made by the select board from each town. So each town has a seat at the um, um, uh, on on the board, and you know they make decisions on for for the municipalities. Um, yeah. The the 
when the legislature created these, the idea was to create a, a structure for something that is perhaps larger than a town, not, doesn't follow county lines, um, perhaps most analogous to the old fire districts, mm -hmm. which, which cover a service area. <coughs> that was really the, the concept. <coughs> Try to run through this a little quicker. Um, this is just an overview of H513, uh, the stuff I think would be important to you. Uh, we talked about the connectivity fund, uh, connectivity initiative. We've got more money for that. Vermont Economic Development Authority loan program. This is the next big pot of money. It's actually a much bigger pot of money. They have $12 million um, in um, uh, loan authority, so they can make up to $12 million in loans to um, organizations that want to build broadband. Each individual loan can be up to $4 million. That would include the, um, uh, well, they can be up to $4 million in loans. Um, this uh, it says launch in FY 2020. We are actually in FY 2020 that started July 1. The program is up and running now, so they've given out, or they're, they're uh, about to award their first loan. Um, so it's up and running, it works. Um, well, at least in that, they can give out money. Um, and so that's definitely an important program to look out for um, when you um, are thinking about uh, a broadband project. Um, technical assistance, um, just point to Rob again. Um, w the bill also gave us um, an additional staff person who can work directly with communities on an ongoing basis. So I'm going to, you know, come in, blow through here, and, and leave you all. But Rob um, is going to stay for the course, and he will be there um, when you need him. Um, we also have $100,000 for municipal technical assistance. Uh, for wireless coverage. This was um, a thing added by the Senate. Um, this came out of a, a project called Coverage Co. Uh, uh, like it was mentioned, we have, we have some cell equipment um, and we can give you a grant um, to uh, take that equipment and do something with it. Um, we had put out in a, a request for proposals to get a consultant um, that would actually be available to towns under this. We did not receive any bids, so um, we are going to move to um, providing grants directly to towns so you can go out and hire your own consultant. Let's see. All right, talked about mapping. Um, a couple of things we do, broadband mapping, this is where we can be really helpful to you, at least in the beginning when you're thinking about where's broadband, where do we have it, where do we need it, we can provide you with broadband data. Um, we manage a middle mile fiber network. This is not uh, applicable to Bennington County. We have no fiber in Bennington. We have a lot of fiber in the Northeast Kingdom and a lot of fiber in the Upper Valley. Um, and then we also do wireless licensing of state-owned property. So if you're interested in a wireless project, state parks, um, state buildings are all good places to site uh, facilities. We do a lot of work with getting license agreements to use state land for um, wireless facilities. Now for the most important part, the Broadband Innovation Grant. This is a planning grant, so you don't know what you want to do yet with broadband, so you're not going to get a VITA loan, um, you're not going to get a federal uh, grant uh, because uh, you don't have a plan yet. Um, we can provide you funding to come up with a plan. This is called the Broadband Innovation Grant, or BIG. Um, we're issuing BIG in three rounds. Uh, we, did our, uh, we issued our first RFP in August of um, 2019, this year, this past August. Um, and we did that, we're, look, we're looking for three uh, projects. Really, anyone who's ready to go, we wanted to get some money out the door. Um, in 2020, we'll have a, um, uh, a round for electric utilities. We are to 
um, grant to not more than two electric utilities, one of these uh, broadband innovation grants. But in April, April is the big time for the big uh, program. Um, we're waiting until after town meeting day. So towns have a chance to organize and think about what they want to do. And then we'll have, we'll give out the majority of the money. We'll probably award um, six to seven of these um, grants at that time. So um, a lot happening there. Um, this program is to fund, fee uh, do feasibility studies. Um, you're to look at uh, what, um, what should you be doing with broadband and if there's a feasible project, um, putting together a business plan to get it done. How are you going to fund it? Who are you going to build to first? What's your take rate going to be? What are you going to charge? Things like that. We can give you up to $60,000 for these grants, um, which is a, a very good start uh, to paying for um, such a study. Um, like I just mentioned, each grant has two parts. Um, so you want to investigate the feasibility of doing a project, and then if, if it looks like it's probably feasible, put together a detailed business plan. Um, don't worry about electric utilities. Uh, I also wanted to call out um, our Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Uh, the bill included an additional $45,000 for them to do something very similar. So they have money that could be used um, in conjunction with a big grant, or if you don't get a big grant, um, the, you could also uh, speak with them. Uh, let's just go into more detail. I already talked about this a little bit, um, so I'm going to go through this quickly so Stan has some time to talk. Um, you know, I've already talked about it, I'll just keep going. Um, I want to talk a little bit about fiber to the home um, the partnerships. Um, this might even be in Stan's province a little bit, so I will also go quick. Um, a lot of towns that have been successful, I call it Craftsbury, EC Fiber. Um, they've they've partnered with a contractor to do to actually provide broadband. Um, that's uh, a model that's worked all over the country. There's there's examples in Massachusetts. Uh, examples in Maryland, Virginia, um, really all over the place. Uh, but in that model, the town usually builds um, the infrastructure, the, they extend the fiber, either middle mile or all the way. A contractor does the day-to-day -day operations, so the town is out of it uh, when it comes to actually provisioning the service. Um, it's complicated. This is all the things you need to think about. I won't go over them. I think Stan's going to cover that too. Am I wrong? Or, okay. Yeah. I am wrong? No, I'll, I'll okay. cover it. All right. And it's order. also very expensive and also very complicated. <laughs> and that's but it's project. totally doable. Very doable. <laughs> but it needs to throw in our slice. <laughs> and to talk about how it's doable. <laughs> I promise not to trash the federal government anymore, although I could Jeff for another Dewey. half hour, but Laura can. Mm -hmm. um, in most cases, the money they've given out has, has, has hindered us. So yes. um, I'm the, uh, I've been working on this for 12 years, and I've been board chair, CFO, and all this other stuff, but so my title doesn't matter. But it, the, the, the thing um, Clay was mentioning at the end is, is what's important is the partnership between the, the towns, which is the communications union district, 24 towns, and ValleyNet that's made this possible. And I can cite a counterexample where it didn't work, where Burlington Telecom tried to do it all themselves within a city department. And trust me, you don't want the towns involved in the management of these um, businesses. So, I mean, they, they are at a high level, but really we, we run things day to day, and that's not like scrolling the mouse. It goes quick. All right, so EC Fiber is 24 towns, and that's key. You, you need towns. We're, we, we, we may do this for other communications union districts. We're not going to do it for districts that have one, two, three, four. In Vermont, you need, I mean, CD Fiber is 17 towns. It's like 15, 20 towns because towns will attract the attention of an operator like us or a for profit operator. We have to be a non profit, and it will also attract capital. We've raised $30 million in revenue, bond market, and that's a tiny offering. 
did over three years. To raise less than that is even more difficult because no one will talk to you. So what the town does, it, it, it owns the assets, it issues bonds that are tax-free, which is very helpful in keeping our interest costs down. It dictates general policy, like we want it to be net neutral. We want to cover unserved areas first. DC Fiber is all volunteers, I mean thousands. I, I calculated about six or 7,000 hours of, of just people attending uh, meetings since 2008. And again, they contracted with us, but they leave the operations to us. But the other thing about a communications district is, is that the, the town can't waste any money on this because the state won't allow it. So the EC Fiber Towns have spent no money um, doing this. <laughs> there wasn't any grant money available at the time, so Valiant kind of funded it for them. So Valiant doesn't have any shareholders. We, we, we've been around since 94. We started out doing dialogue. We sold that to focus on fiber at home. Since 2007, we're doing EC Fiber. We expanded across the river into Lyme, New Hampshire, and we're doing universal fiber. So every home is covered with fiber, except for the one in the corner, like Clay said, that might be fed from a much district town. It's like 99% of people are getting fiber all the way, and there's a lot of coming. CB Fiber has been established. There's a district forming around St. Johnsbury. There may be one down in Wyndham coming. And so, again, general guidelines that the, the bond market likes the fact that, that, that the towns aren't involved managing this. They like the fact that there's an operator that has some expertise doing it. Also, the fact that the district has no uh, employees means that it can't have any unfunded pension liabilities, which the, which the um, bond market hates. So um, this is EC Fiber. We go from West Windsor up to Brookfield. Mount Pelier is kind of an outlier. It's actually joined CB Fiber. So there's a big, big district here, big district there. You can see where we are in the state. I mean, I, 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 my, my guess would be the state needs six, seven, or, or eight of these. It doesn't need 20. Um, and what, what it allows us to do is it does reasonable averaging. So our Rupert is here in Hancock or Granville. We have 500 people, 600 people. These towns are fully covered already. So you can do it in towns that have low, low densities. So there are about eight homes per mile of road or something, but they're offset by Thetford that maybe has 16 or something. So our average across all these, all these towns, with the exception of Hartford, which is fully cabled, and we don't know what we're going to do there yet, but it's about 14 homes per, per mile in the area. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, Stan, but uh, just to, if you talk to a, a commercial provider, they say they need a minimum, minimum of 16 homes per mile to make it feasible, right? They normally stop at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a marginal density of about, about 20, but their average densities are actually much higher. For example, Hartford is 35 homes per, per mile. It's fully cabled because it's profitable. But. So yeah, I mean, you, 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 you need a low cost thing. I'll talk a little bit about that. So how do we, we have 1,000 miles of network. We're, we're, there's 1,400 miles of unserved um, roads in those 24 towns, and we'll be done with those in early uh, 2021, probably. So you had a willing operator, which was us. We happened to be around and weren't doing dial-up anymore. We had a lot of volunteers from all, 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 all the towns. We, 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 we still meet monthly. I don't know why, but you know, our, our, our chair <laughs> likes to meet monthly. Good coffee. But anyway, the, the towns signed a contract with us that they basically cedes all the operations to us, and the bond market likes that. They, they're not going to. So you know, if there's any complaints about the operations, they come to us, not the towns. The towns don't really want to be involved in that. And when we started small, we built a steady track record and then attracted um, private capital. I won't Stan, what, did, what did the volunteers do? Well, they set policy and they do all the things that a district has to do, like make sure that we're repaying our debt and publishing minutes and, and, and governing and, and managing, you know, Valiant provides them with information and, and, and they provide opinions. But honestly, they don't do much on the operational side. So that's the, the district that's the volunteers you're referring yeah. to? Can you talk about what they did in the beginning, though? Sure. Well, they, they had to get the towns organized. That's essentially what they did. And, and I, I don't think that all the towns need to put it on the ballot. I think two or three need to put it on a ballot and form a district, and then select boards can, two. can join their efforts. So it's two. We'll lower the top of this. So they were very active early on. And, you know, and the other thing we did is, I, I didn't need to get into this, but the first, we had no money. So from 2011 to 2016, we raised seven million dollars from 500 customers, essentially in our area. A median investment of five thousand dollars, and that funded the first three or four hundred miles of, 
of, of network. It got us to the point where then we could raise money in bigger chunks. The governing board members were very influential in, 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 in making those investments. And then in 2016, we repaid everybody, yay, with interest and principal. So they were happy, and I was really happy because I didn't want my neighbors to all go um, broke. <laughs> These are our numbers, and I think the key here is it just, it's just cost control. If you talk to a bunch of people or consultants, I hate those feasibility studies, this number doesn't show up very often. Like the cost per mile to do fiber to the home, I haven't seen it much lower than this, and you have to do it at this price in these markets in order to have these metrics work and for us to be able to take you know, the, the amount of money we have relative, we have $30 million in debt, and we're, we're, we're repaying it slowly. But that's sort of what you need. It costs about $105 per customer. We don't have a huge take rate, I'm surprised. But I mean, this is, this is of E911 location. So these include some accessory buildings and, and non-households. But um, you know, we're, we're doing fine, and we're raising you know, another $11 million in about six weeks, probably at closer to 4.5% because interest rates are a lot lower. And, and the key for this money, unlike the, the, the state loans, which are only for five years, they're kind of a bridge. It has to be repaid over a long, long, long time because this stuff is not profitable. So 20, 25, 30 years. And that's what the RUS loan program does, does too. The problem with the RUS loan program, and Clay was kind enough not to mention anyone specifically, but I can't. And that, but that money that went to VTEL Wireless was a complete waste because they don't have very many customers and the service sucks. It also stops any town that's covered by that VTEL Wireless covered network. Covered in quotations. Yes, covered. To, to getting any of these loans, so uh, that covers the entire town of Sandgate. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it's really it's really bad. I'm still mad at Bernie about about organizing that. So what I would say is, there's no downside in organizing a district. It's the, the, the downside is the volunteer hours that are spent. But look, DC Fiber has a charter. CB Fiber has a charter. You can call up and say, hey, give me your charter, and you can you could probably still get it on the on the town meeting ballots in, in a couple towns, and then you have the select boards join afterwards, because once you have that in place, you're more likely to get a grant. You can talk to Rob about actually attracting an operator. I don't that probably wouldn't be valiant because we're so far away, but it really, it's not that hard. If you have a competent cable operator or a communications operator that runs a, a recurring revenue business, once the district, once, once, once the stuff is built, it's relatively easy to run. We, we have no churn. I mean, once people sign up for fiber, they virtually never leave us. I mean, we have moves and, 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 and changes, but no one really leaves the... Uh... And so, and, and we also have, you know, five or six years of audited financials, so you can see sort of what metrics you need to be looking at to attract, A, the beta financing to get you to the point where, in our case, it's a, it's a, it, 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 it's a revenue bond. It's a municipal revenue bond. And, the, the, the company that we use, the underwriter, is anxious to do more of these if they have numbers that are similar to what EC Fiber has, has done. So I, I'm surprised that more districts haven't been formed given that there's no downside. But Laura's going to talk about that later. So I would just add one more thing on the districts that I didn't at the beginning. So uh, with, with electricity, with rural electrification, rural electrification happened through co-ops, right? CUDs are the co-ops for, inter for internet. This is how we can get it done. Stan, do you know why your take rate is about 35%? No, if I did, I'd make it higher. But, um, so my, my, my supposition is that you know, there's probably 30% of the households in our area that, that maybe are second homes or camps. And they don't always get internet. And I, there are probably 35% of the people that are, they, they have the good luck of being close to a DSLAM, which is a place where the DSL service comes out of. If you're close to one of those things, you can get decent internet. And the other thing is you can have a very nice, clean copper pair that goes from the DSLAM to your house and get decent internet. And they're probably older folks that um, may not have the, they, they may not be streaming yet, so they have Direct Dish or uh, Direct TV or Dish, so they're not trying to stream YouTube or Netflix. And I think there's also people that can't afford even $75 a month that are just using their, their cell phones if they happen to have coverage. And, and we are trying to, when we get to a higher take rate, we're going to offer, and we may be able to get some grants to do this, offer free and reduced school lunch households and income stamp households a, a lower sort of lifeline rate. So that's in the plan in the future. We need to finish building our network and getting a few more customers. 
Yes. So when we talk about the forming a district or whatever language we use, um, we talk about individuals, but this would also include schools. It's 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 um, emergency. I, I'm just trying. No, to No, it's understand. just towns. The, the districts are composed of towns. I'm sorry. What? It's towns. The whole town. So whatever, whether it's a business, whatever's schools, in that town. Whatever's in. Okay, that's I just. So what, what, once the town is part of the district, here's what we do for schools, libraries, and uh, and town halls. They don't even use e-rate because it's a pain in the ass to get the paperwork done. We offer our lowest rate, which is seventy-four dollars a month. And we offer them 700 megabits per second symmetrical service, which we're not covering Woodstock High School yet, but we will next year. I think VTEL charges them $2,000 a month for that, for that service. So, you know, that's part of our community service effort. We probably have 50 locations in, in those 24 towns that have, especially libraries. Um, so that's the kind of thing you yeah. can do when the district controls, you know, that, that's another thing that the, the governing board worked with us and said, hey, how can we help our, our schools and libraries? And we said, well, it's not that much to offer them a really high speed for a, a low rate because there's only 50 locations. Yes? Um, something that you had mentioned in the uh, in the remarks was that ValleyNet had uh, provided a dial-up service prior to embarking on this, um, you know, FETH. Um, I'm curious if there are similar industries or that, that Makes, you know, if we don't have a, a valley net in this region, are there other um, sort of close cousins to that sort of service that we provided that we may want to make sure we have this conversation with who might have the skills, the knowledge? Right, and I, I think you'd find that out if you formed a district and applied for a grant and as part of that grant did a, a broad survey of businesses in the area that were willing to, I mean the obvious ones are sort of utilities, like electric utilities, <laughs> gas utilities, or you want someone that, that has some, I think, expertise with re re recurring uh, you know, service and, and maintenance and, and repair. The, the, the building of the fiber is a pretty specialized thing, and frankly, we use contractors for most of that, but we're the general contractor, so you have to have somebody that understands the, the technology well enough to make sure that you end up with a system that costs 30000 a mile and not 50000 a mile, because at 50000 a mile, it, it doesn't work. Ultimately, you would put out an RFP, sure. right, for this is what we want to build. Our towns have come together, we've worked with Rob, we got this grant, we figured it out, here's our RFP world, here's what we're trying to build in this region. And there, so Carol Monroe, who works with um, uh, Stan, has talked about um, they're always getting multiple people responding to those, okay. multiple companies responding to those. It's something I've been concerned about myself, Jonathan, but we have people that are starting to you know, like kind of circle around, wave, Mr. Reed in the back, we have a consultant back there. There's one, um, you know, there's, there are others. And that's, yeah. That has the issue that I run up against, that we are at the mercy of the providers mm -hmm. because your money is going to be bid on by providers and it's going to be the providers that are actually the best that's what he said, that when yeah. they, you know... Oh, the grant money, you mean? Yes, the money that actually builds so, the network. There's not enough money okay. in that grant program right. to, to build it on its own. And I that's not where you start. I, yeah. Nonetheless, yeah. once a community a union district exists without a ballot net, yeah. The union, if the valley, if the union district is stuck with yep. consolidated or cut and Comcast, which is what there is here, period. Yeah. They, we're they, not going in. They won't participate anywhere. in these districts because they. And so, who's inventing the valley net for they're, they're southwestern out there. Vermont? So in Wyndham That's County. What we're working on. Yeah, they're working on doing this in Wyndham County. But there are providers. I have two of my towns. Okay. I have an organization or an entity called Matrix who has done some work. You know, I am encouraging those towns not to work on their own, but Matrix is a company that would respond to an RFP from providers, you know? Um, there are others. 
We, and this is mission is broadband any, back here. Is anything being done so that those providers have to be open about the information of the networks that they build? Um, in other words, we can't get internet providers around here to tell us, show us where their fiber is. You have secret little talks with them at tables where they say, okay, I'll show you this map, but you yeah. can't. Well, that's up to the district, and, and the, our districts, and by, by law, the financials and everything else are fully transparent. That was actually a problem with Burlington Telecom. It sort of got merged into the government. They didn't know they were spending more money than they, they, they should have. But the communicating union district can set that policy. You can go to our website and click and see every road that's covered by fiber. It's, it's all but with public. the rest of the ISPs around here, it doesn't happen. Period. Well, that's, I'm, we're, you're, you're sort of, I'm sort of suggesting you form your own ISP. Exactly. The, the, that's essentially what, what districts do. Or, or e e well, enable... That's, that's not what you've been saying here. And, so, the, and the, the gray area between the ISP of Valley Met and the, and the Communication Union District is a little... I, I watch that and I, you know, in... I'm very uncomfortable. With I think you're off base. Slide. Look, there's no downside to form a district. Form a district and no, see what happens. No if, if nothing happens, you you, dis, you dissolve it and say, okay, we'll try something else. But I'm telling you, you're going to more likely to get a grant, you're more likely to get an operator, and you're more likely to get a veto loan if you've got a district with 10 or 15 people than one or two towns. Because if Clay has to work with, you know, how many towns are there in 150 it's towns to get this done? Hard. It's not going to happen. But if he works with five or six districts, it, it can happen, so. He's giving us all the solutions to the problems in there. Believe yeah. me, it's not perfect and it's hard work, but at least it's been it's done so once in Vermont. None of this other stuff has really been done on any sort of scale. I mean, we've got a thousand miles of network. We're paying back the debt. It's okay. just one. Mike, do you want to? Can I just try to help out a little bit? <clears throat> and I'm just going to talk about other states just so we don't pick on a particular town. What we've seen, what I've seen in about 100 years I've been doing this, is you can put out an RFP to have somebody build your network. You can put out an RFP to have somebody else operate your network. I'm working with towns right now who have said, I'm not going to spend $20 million of anybody's money to build. I'm going to put out an RFP, as Laura described, I truly support that. And you know what? It may be consolidated. It may be a Chesterfield, right? That's the most recent one we have around just the other side of these mountains we drove over today. Um, so the, every situation is unique. I think it was. Yeah, but here's road. the problem with Chesterfield. Once you take Chesterfield out of that area, yes. all the other towns are screwed because they're lower density. So you'll never form a district around Chesterfield now because CCI, once again, cherry pick the high density areas and they're not going to do that town. They're not going to do Rupert. I, I was just using that as an Okay, but I'm, sing, not, I'm, I'm saying single town solutions tend to favor the towns that have the most density, that are the most profitable to build. And if you don't average out, you're going to leave out the other parts of the state. So the beauty of EC Fiber is that it covers towns like Hancock and Granville. Well, I'm sorry I'm passionate about this, but I've seen this stuff like fail. And I know the private operator, I used to be a private operator. I do the same thing. That's what they're incented to do. So I think if you band together, you're going to eventually come up with a solution. It might take a long time. It's taken EC Fiber since 2007. shouldn't take you that long, but in the end, you'll be done because you'll have a fiber network that doesn't have to be replaced. If you come up with some rinky-dinky thing like fixed wireless here and the DSL and blah, 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 in 10 years, you're going to be in the same situation. This fiber stuff, you know, we're at 1 gigabit per second now. We can change out to 10 gigabit per second at an investment of about $600 per, per customer if anyone ever needed 10 gig. But in 50 years, when my grandkids or great grandkids are around, they're still going to be using that same fiber for the most part. So, what's up, Mike? Mike, do you want to? Um... No, I, I just didn't want people to be discouraged before they start. Yeah. Yep. And I, I do not disagree, nor do I agree with everything. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I will say that in a very small town across the river, I think I heard they had five different people bid. Um, I'm working with a town completely out of New England right now. Uh, we just completed the art, just had the responses back, and I don't even know how many there are. And there were a combination of people who want to run it, like EC Fiber does, people who want to build it, like maybe the uh, uh, representative Sebelius said uh, Matrix. There's lots of fiber companies out there. So 
There's a lot, just don't be discouraged before you begin. I don't think you've no. only got one choice. Um, and, well, you know, more more people help. Can I just add one, one thought to that? South of us in Massachusetts, they have a broadband program. Very successful, actually. Um, the reason it's successful is because the state of Massachusetts has decided to spend $45 million on that program. Um, the way it works is it works a lot like our connectivity initiative in that um, communities get to decide whether they would like to just have cable networks expanded or they'd like to do their own system. And uh, the vast majority of the communities, I think there are 40 towns in the Cape, um, in the Pioneer Valley, most of them said, look, we just want to get it's the cable plant built out as a rest of this town. They were either 60, 70, 80, 90% built out with cable. Cable finished the job. And in some areas, that might make sense. And you shouldn't take it off the table. I, I understand that people have strong feelings about Comcast or Consolidated. Um, but it might be the most economical option for your town. There are a lot of places, especially in Bennington and Wyndham County, where it's not going to work out because there are, is no cable whatsoever. I assume Rupert and Sandgate don't have any cable. Um, Reedsboro, um, a lot of towns around just don't have um, cable services. There's nothing to expand on. And that's, that's where these projects make sense. Um, Stan talked about Hartford. Hartford, you know, when EC Fiber will get there, who knows? Uh, but the reason is because there's cable there, it might make more sense just to finish the job in a town like that. Okay, so we, have, um, yeah. we have 10 minutes left. I want to make sure we end on time. We have a quick question here, and then I want to make sure that um, everybody is connected um, before we leave to each other and that we have a sense of what we're going to do next. So. There you go. Um, my my question is, all right. I'm going to be an optimist and say there's yes. you get organized and you do this. Okay. My next question is maintenance of it. So you so so these guys can give it. I'm going to. I don't want you maintaining it. Okay. Well, some. I mean, I'm yes. just saying. Yes. I, so as you're going to put out. You're going to consume. Yep. I'm not saying I can make it. You are going to say, you're going to say what you would have liked to have said to these, you know, comp big companies that aren't covering you. Okay. Here's what we want in these towns. Okay. We know this is what we want in these towns. World, this is what we want in these towns, RFP. Okay. People are going to respond. Operators <coughs> are going to respond. You could form an ISP to operate it. I hope you don't. You know, I hope you just use someone that already is doing this. But that you work together to set the terms, okay? So that you guys are getting what you need and what you want. And you're not, because if you're waiting for somebody to bring it, I think it's pretty clear it's not happening. So what's the magic dust of a district that makes uh, ISPs who aren't uh, building out in those areas now suddenly decide there's an RFP to build out in this area that we've never wanted to build out in? It's just scale. I mean, why would I respond to an RFP in one town if I could go run a district with 20? I mean, you'll, one, a single town district will never be profitable because it's too hard to operate. We, we run trucks out of Royalton for an hour in all directions. I mean, you can't do that individually in each town. One, this town has this operator, this town has another operator. I mean, there's a reason CCI covers all of New England. I mean, even 24 towns is tiny from a telecommunications perspective. There's very few companies around that, that, that are that small. I mean. Champlain Valley and companies like that, but they're sort of old, you know, monopolies that were funded with federal funds. So it's it's just pure. You, 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 it's just hard to explain. It's you, you can't run things in a single town very efficiently. The, the other is is also the allocation of risk. So Valley, if Valley Net were to come in by itself, it would be assuming all of the risk. But there's some there's some uh, amount of allocation of risk between the town and the operator. Question in the back? If I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, what you're saying is Sandgate by itself is not interesting to anybody. But Sandgate and Rupert and Manchester 
and a couple other towns, starts to get very interesting for somebody to run as a business. Well, and it's not a business that we own, it's a business that works for us. Yes. Well, in fact, the towns do own this, this, Net. this, this, this network. If something goes wrong, though, the towns are not at risk. It hasn't affected their, their, um, their, their, their credit rating because the recourse of the bonds is solely to the revenue that comes from the, from the fiber optic network. And so someday, I mean, if we got, if we got our take rate from 35% to 65%, it would start throwing off cash that could be distributed back to the town's taxpayers. I'm not saying that. We'll probably end up cutting rates and stuff, but it's the towns do own it as a, as, as a group. Uh, the, the ownership part is not of interest to me personally. No, you're right. I mean, it's it's, a, it's a, if, if a couple of smaller towns and a couple of larger towns yes. are all thrown in the pot together, some, it, it's interesting to somebody. Yes. Yeah. Does the existing coverage in those towns matter? Like the blue of Manchester, does that change things at all? Uh, a, a little bit. I mean, what we do is we, we essentially well, build the donut. So in Manchester, we would have to build through cabled areas to get to the roads that aren't covered. And you know, we compete there and we do okay, but our take rate is about half the rate it is in the served areas. And so we've, we've built the donuts of all these towns first, and now if we get enough take rate in those cabled areas, we'll go build them. We've had very good success with small businesses. Donut means you go to a town, right? And so there's a village in the middle of the town. Always have That's a where bit most of, of the people are, right? So it's really easy to cover. You can make a lot of money. So you cover that spot in the middle, right? And then everybody else, nah, too expensive. Right? And so it's hard to cover everybody else. That's what donut all means. So right. that, that heavy spot. Well, it's, it's, it's hard in one sense, in, in that it, it is more expensive there, but there's no competition, essentially, because you're competing against DSL. And the cost to, 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 to get on the poles is less because. Um, less. Yeah, so the, of the $30,000, about 5000 is spent paying Green Mountain Power and the phone company to give us space on the poles. If there's only two things on the poles, electric and telephone, that's what it costs. If there's three things and cable, then you start to have to replace more poles. Those costs can then increase to ten or fifteen thousand a mile, and and it, it may or may not work with with the tape rate. But it's sort of counterintuitive. There's also not a lot of businesses in the donut, but it's it's pretty simple. It's you know it 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 it, it, it creates numbers in towns that have those dense um, those populations that are sufficient to track private capital and, and repay it. There's other ways to get funding, but that's how we've done it. Eric? Uh, so in southern Vermont, are, are there any CUDs now or being talked about where other towns can join, or what is the status of that? So there are no CUDs yet in Wyndham and Bennington County. Is that true? We don't have any Wyndham and Bennington County. So y yes. Uh, uh, Valley Net is working <coughs> with a couple of other entities and our regional planning commission in Wyndham to look at a region wide CUD. And when Some, you say region, would that be 20, and like 27 and towns? Towns. Well, right now it's 27 towns. Okay. So there's no reason why, you know, it couldn't be, Bigger. you know, sure. You know, but it, so you have to, you have to get the town to say yes. So that's where volunteers come into play, right? Like going to the select board, like, hey, we're meeting with this group, we think we can do it, the CUD is formed, it's four towns right now, but we think we could join, um, you know, here's what it would look like. So you start building it, putting it together. It takes two towns to start. That's what I wanted to ask about. So what, um, I wanted to make sure I wanted- yeah, another question. Okay, yeah, another question. Uh, just a quick one, um, uh, Tim, did a lot of research in Shaftesbury. I'm in Sunderland. Um, I go online and look, and it says we're 94% covered for, uh, and for Tim is saying like for uh, yes. broadband. I, I don't know, I'm one of these. Uh, yes. Chart looks Probably something like this, but anyway. And uh, Tim is saying, you know, wasn't true in Shaftesbury. <laughs> but so what do we believe and how do we find out uh, what our real coverage is. So I would say to you that the best maps are with the department and that the department can help, you know, clarify. I don't know what There's a simpler say. way. I'd say if you don't have fiber or cable, 
you're, you're uncovered or you soon will be. Because the copper is not getting any better and people's needs for speeds are increasing. I mean, we, we started at five megabits per second in 2011. We couldn't afford much more. So, so it, it, take a look at your town and if there's no fiber and no cable, I consider you uncovered yeah. and, and the federal government will at some point in the future. And our, our cable line maps are really accurate because they're required to send us their plant data. So okay. it's not it's not like the DSL where they're trying to um, figure out what an, a single actress could possibly get. This is where the cable with the, with the 25-3 maps um, that provided everyone. That's where the cable plant actually is. I mean, the problem with 253, yeah, so it's already out of date. Yeah. You can't do a high speed well, two way video conference it's, with it's, it. It's 253 or better. So cable companies aren't selling you 253, they're selling you 150 slash. Cable companies are fine. And look, if they decided to build all of this area, I'd go away. They're not going to, so that's the problem. Right. But you have to know where they are because it's a, that, that's going to be your, your competition. You know, you're going to be competing against the bundle. They offer TV, they offer internet, they offer phone, and they offer now wireless. Um, a lot of people find that convenient. Um, they just have one bill with all that stuff on it. So, if you want to create some urgency, you can put the stock price of consolidated communications and Frontier on your on your on your phone and, and watch it. Consolidated was fourteen dollars a share. My heart can't take it. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> it's now it's now four dollars. Okay. And Fairpoint went yeah. bankrupt already, so I'm just telling you now. Five to ten years, Consolidated is going bankrupt. You heard it here. Okay. So a couple things <laughs> on that note. Uh, on that note, um, but don't leave. I I want to thank everybody who took a tremendous amount of time to drive from a long way away to come and give us some really valuable information. But don't leave or clap yet. I just wanted to make sure I didn't forget to thank everybody because um, some of these folks drove a couple of hours on a, on a cold night to be here and provide us with information that, that I hope we can use. So that is a huge, I'm personally very grateful that you guys were willing to come down here and talk to us. Um, a couple things to, um, to wrap up. If you came in and didn't sign up um, on the email list and you want to be on the email list, please sign up. If you don't want me to put your name on a list and reach out to you, scratch your name off. Um, because the only way I can be helpful um, going forward is to make sure that we're all connected. So if you don't want to get on my list, let me know. If you didn't sign up for the list, please make sure to do that. Um, I wanted to leave with some next steps. I heard some dates that were uh, red flags in my head. Uh, I heard town meeting and that a couple of towns uh, are going to need to maybe have it on the ballot or have a referendum. And I heard April, I heard a February grant date and an April grant date April. for planning grants. April is the one. Yeah. So April is the one. So um, I'm wondering if folks who are willing to form a task force would raise their hands. Okay, Tim, great. So we've got Rupert, we've got Sandgate, we've got Shaftesbury, we've got Bennington, we've got Manchester, Sunderland, Sunderland. and Sunderland. Yeah. So did we get all the communities? <laughs> Super. So if you are willing to be on the task force as you leave, please put a star Go by see. your name. Go see Rob. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and check in with Rob because I'm feeling like we should meet really soon. Um, one thing I, I'm not sure I understand is which towns have to get on the ballot and who. So I, in my mind, I, I think we there as a town official, uh, anything that goes on the March ballot has got to be nailed down. Uh, in December, right, yeah. or maybe into January, depending on how fast your printer is. But uh, if we're going to do something on a March ballot, we we need to be meeting soon next week. You don't have to be a CUD in order to apply for the grant in April. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct, right? So we have ValleyNet and the Regional Planning Commission in Wyndham County 
applied for a grant in this first round to look at the formation of a CUD. <coughs> so you do, to form a CUD, have to have those town meetings, but you can have a special town meeting in September, you know, or mm -hmm. you know, whatever, if you, if you get it. The first you two is... That there's no downside to forming a CUD? Do I, would you say, do I agree? Yeah. Uh, uh, let me, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think the, the, probably the least amount of risk, if you could get adequately covered, is for a national provider to cover you. But um, you're at risk right now with those that aren't covering you and the ones that are covering you with old technology that are not going to replace it. So yes, I think that there's no downside to at least coming together and let's build a plan and let's see if we can it's, make it work. It, it's a very good question though. We had to address it a lot in 2008 and what we said is call Paul Giuliani in Montpelier Ooh, who knows that. everything about bonding in Vermont was our sort of pro bono counsel in the early days and when he talks to the town managers and the town finance guys they'll listen because he does a lot of the Vermont bond back stuff and it's it's pretty much airtight. I mean you could talk to any of the 24 towns as you described it, this task force could apply for a grant to yes. form. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, an important date also, no, no, November 19th. I apologize, Kathleen. November 19th from noon to 1, there's going to be a webinar. It's done. I, I work at the Brattleboro Development Credit Corp, and they have a program called Knowledge Bites. On that webinar, Paul Giuliani, who's a municipal attorney, many of you probably know, specializes in telecom, and Carol Monroe, who works with um, Stan, and I will be on there taking questions and talking about the formation of a CUD. So we'll get Kathleen the information. Jonathan, in the back, from Bennington County Regional Commission, can also connect you to that webinar, okay, if need be. But I would recommend, definitely, if you're interested, a couple of people hop on. Mm -hmm. Great, so I will, um, I think the next thing I'll do is send out an email um, to everybody who's here and wants to be on the list. And then uh, I will probably turn over that list and the uh, leadership of the task force to somebody who is not going to be up in Montpelier starting January 7th. So um, I feel like we got a good start. I really, really appreciate everybody turning out. Um, again, especially the folks who drove. And um, Tim, I know, who's here from Shaftesbury, is, has done a lot of research and work. And so uh, he will be a key person on said task force. <laughs> Um, and I think with that, we'll give the yeah. presentation so we can. Yeah. Great. We'll also send you a link to the PowerPoints. And on that note, thank you, Kathleen. Huzzah! Thank, thank you, Kathleen.